Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Last week we looked at the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. But what God said before he gave the Ten Commandments must be emphasized once again. In chapter 20, verse 2, God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In other words, before God gives them the commandments, he reminds them of what he has already done for them. He rescued them. He delivered them. He has set them free from their bondage. And that's the way God always works. God is always into saving us, rescuing us, delivering us from the bondage of our sin. He's the author of our faith, and he's the finisher of our faith. We simply responded to the gospel of Christ, and he saved us. And it's only after we are born again and have become new creations in Christ, then the sanctification process kicks in, and he begins to mold us and shape us more and more into the image and likeness of Jesus. And we're all still in process. As I look around this room, nobody is perfect. So don't have any grand illusions of yourself. We'll strike that down here momentarily. But once again, God is the initiator and we are the responders. But never forget, like God says here in verse 2, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And that's important because so many people, when they think about the Bible, when they think about following God, they wrongly believe that if they do follow the Lord, they're going to be put under a bunch of rules, rituals, and regulations. They wrongly think that God will put them in bondage, but just the opposite is true. True freedom is found only in the Lord. And so that's why God reminds the Israelites, I'm not bringing you into bondage. I brought you out of bondage. I brought you out of that miserable place in Egypt. I have set you free. I delivered you. I saved you. And so now I'm giving you my word. And so that's the proper order as we look at the commandments. Again, that's what the Lord did with us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were all evil in God's eyes. We were all uh, wicked in God's eyes. We were in bondage to the lies of Satan in this world, but God. And that's what Ephesians chapter 2 is all about. Look at Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4. It says, but God, after going through this list of all of us being dead in our sins, being pulled around by the God of this world, Satan, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, uh, he, he first of all says, A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, God's commandments to a child of God are not a burden. They're not a heavy weight that we are carrying around. Again, Jesus has fulfilled all of the law on our behalf. And the Holy Spirit has written God's laws upon our hearts. And the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And again, Jesus says that's the fulfillment of all the law and prophets. Jesus fulfilled it all. Once again, God loves us unconditionally. In other words, we can't earn his love by trying to keep his law. We just need to receive his love and that the Holy Spirit then will enable us to walk in his love. But it's sad that so many people question God's love for them. How do I know God loves me? How do I know God wants to set me free? It's already been shared, but it's looking to the cross. We look to the cross. That's where you see God's love for you, God's love for me. All you have to do is realize God sent his only begotten son into this sinful world to die on the cross for you. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 clearly says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He never said, get your act together clean up your life and then come to me. But he said, no, while you're still sinners, Christ died for us. And what did Jesus, you know, uh, what he did for us on the cross, that is the greatest proof of all that God loves you and me. 
So as we simply believe God's word and follow the Lord, we get to experience God's love for us. We get to experience his grace toward us. We get to experience his plans and purposes for our lives. And it's not a burden. If anybody feels burdened down by the Lord, by the word of God, that is not of the Lord. It's only a burden when we're trying to earn God's favor or we're trying our hardest to stay on God's good side or be accepted by God or loved by God, that's when our relationship with the Lord becomes a burden. But the burden is removed when we simply start believing the Lord, trusting what he says from his word, and we start walking in the finished work of Christ and what he accomplished on our behalf. This is why Jesus encourages every single one of us in here, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, where he tells us, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And he's referring to the law, burdening people down. That's who he's referring to in chapter 11 of Matthew's gospel. Come to me and I will give you rest. And we'll talk more about that word rest later on. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest, again, very important word, for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so now we pick up with commandment number two. Remember that the first four are dealing with our relationship with God. The final six are dealing with our relationship with others. So as we saw last time, commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me or in my presence. It's not like God's number one and then this is number two and that's number, no, no other gods in his presence before the Lord. So look at verse four, Exodus chapter 20. He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, there's a lot to unpack in these, uh, in these verses here, commandment number two. First of all, this is not a prohibition against carving a statue or having a sculpture or a painting a painting of something. It is not a uh, prohibition against having a elk head or a deer head mounted in your wall, on your living room, or wherever you might put it. God's prohibition is carving an image of something that you believe represents the one true living God, and you think this represents the nature and character of God, and then bowing down to that image and worshiping it. Listen, God abhors any idol or image that a person comes up with that tries to capture the nature and character of God. Why? Because it's impossible to capture the nature and character of God. You can't capture that in a painting or a carving or anything. That's why Jesus tells us in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Since God is infinite, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, he's everywhere, it would be impossible to capture his image and say, this is your God who's brought you out of Egypt. This is your God who has saved you. Now, we'll see when we get to chapter 32, the Israelites will make a carved image. They will make a molten golden calf, saying, this is the God that brought it. No, you can't. Anything we would come up with would fall infinitely short of God Almighty. Again, decorations are fine, but the problem arises when people start worshiping an image, start thinking that will get them closer to the Lord. Forty years after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, and Moses, the last year of his life, 40 years later, they're gathered together. Moses can't go into the Promised Land, but they're about to. And so Deuteronomy is the law given again. And he adds to this, not adding to it, but he's expounding on this. In Deuteronomy 4, verses 15 to 19, Moses says, Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw... No form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourself a carved image in the form of any figure, 
the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps in the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all people under the whole heaven as a heritage. And so, yeah, you don't look at creation and worship creation. You look at the Lord and you worship the Creator. The desire to worship, that's at the core of every human person every human being's life. Without a relationship with the one true living God, people will end up worshiping anything and everything. And for the most part, they'll end up worshiping themselves. After all, the big lie of Satan that he gave to Adam and Eve in the garden, oh, you don't really need God, or he didn't really say that. You will become just like God. That's the lie. You don't need God. You can make yourself a God, or you are a God. That's the lie of Satan. Paul speaks of this in Romans 1. Look at these verses starting in verse 22. This is referring to the devolution of man. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged Notice the truth of God for the lie. Definite article, the lie. I don't need God, I am God. I, can, I need to be worshipped. And they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So very important. Don't make any carved image unto uh, the Lord. You think this represents God. Let's worship it. Not at all. Another reason for this commandment, look at verse 5 once again, where God says, For I, the Lord, uh, your God, am a jealous God. Very important to understand this. It does not mean that God is jealous in the sense that he envies other gods. After all, God knows there's no other gods. They're, they're just a figment of people's imagination. Satan, the god of this world, is a created being. He was Michael or Lucifer, who was just a fallen angel. You know, he's not a god in the sense of being a creator, but he is created in the minds of all these people. Would Emily say last week, 33 million gods the Hindus worship? Crazy. I mean, it's just nuts, but he's behind it all. So God knows fully well all these other gods aren't even real. So he's not jealous of these other gods, but rather he is jealous for you and me. In other words, he wants the best for us because he loves us. He is jealous for us like I am jealous for my wife Elizabeth. Nobody is allowed, nobody is welcome to come between us. That's the type of jealousy God has for us. Later on in Exodus 34, 14, we're told, For you shall worship no other god for the Lord, that's Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Again, he's jealous for us. He doesn't want anything or anybody coming be between you and him. Another thing we see here in the second commandment is that God is so serious about receiving exclusive worship and love for us that he will punish those who refuse to obey him. It says, even to the third and fourth generation, but notice, to those who hate me. In other words, the so-called generational curses can be instantly broken when a person repents of their sin and they turn to Christ. They receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He was cursed by hanging on a tree for us. He took the curse upon himself that we deserve. Now, I've talked to a lot of people about this over the years where they've had a great-grandparent, grandparents, maybe even their parents that were involved in some very occultic, wicked things involved in stuff that was very fleshly, even demonic, and they're afraid it's going to be, you know, passed on to them and take hold of their lives, but it doesn't have to because, again, Jesus can break any and every curse that the enemy tries to place upon you. Jesus has given us a whole new life, a whole new path. Danny quoted this verse earlier. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 emphatically says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... 
And you're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. That's the only two classes of people in the world. You're either in Christ and you're a saint, or you're not in Christ and you're an ain't. Figure it out. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that always has been the heart of the Lord towards us. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is patient, long-suffering. He is abounding in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquities and sin. So again, the bottom line with commandment number two is this. God does not want his children to create any image of him in their minds or with wood, stone, clay, paint, or anything else. After all, the pagan nations, they were all about touching and feeling and seeing their gods of wood, stone, and metal. They all wanted to be able to hold these things. They were image-based religions. But as we read earlier, God told his people that when he descended upon Mount Sinai, they did not see his form. It's impossible to see the form of God. They didn't see his form, but they heard his voice. And now they are hearing his word. And this always goes back to Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so it's through the word of God that the God of the word reveals his nature and character to us. And don't forget 2 Corinthians 5, 7 very simply says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. So that's commandment number two. Look at commandment number three, verse seven. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, Twice in this verse, the name of the Lord is mentioned, and twice the words in vain are mentioned. The word vain means empty or careless, without thought, without honor. And so they can refer to using God's name in a flippant way, a careless way, just throwing his name out there is no big deal, just an ordinary thing. And God says he won't hold that person guiltless. In other words, there will be consequences for using his holy name in an unholy manner. Don't forget what the Apostle Paul says about the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, starting in verse 9. He says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on the earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of the Father. So we should never take the name of the Lord in vain. There is power in the name of Jesus. Don't take his name lightly. Uh, remember when the Apostle Paul and Silas, Timothy, they're all, Luke was there, they're in Philippi and they're proclaiming the gospel to the Philippians. And it says that there was this demon possessed girl that kept following them around. It says every day, and she would shout out, These men are of the most holy God. You know, they're proclaiming to us the way of salvation. What she said was accurate, but Paul, after many days, it says he became greatly annoyed because he realized this is a demon in this girl. And so what does he say? In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And that demon had to leave. The power of the name of Jesus cast the demon out. There's power in the name of Jesus. When the disciples wanted Jesus to teach them how to pray, Jesus simply says in Matthew 6, 9, In this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Not hollow, hallowed. That means how holy is your name. God's name is to be revered. It's to be understood that God's name is holy. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I used the name of God, the name of Jesus, uh, in vain all the time. I would use his name as a curse word. I would use his name when I got mad at somebody. I just threw his name around like it was nothing special. This is why I always say, I know what I deserve. I know what you deserve too, but I know what I deserve. Um, 
Isn't it weird that for me, I don't think anybody ever went around when you got mad at somebody or you got hurt that you would say, ah, Buddha. <laughs> Hare Krishna. No. For the love of Molech. No. It was always the name of God. It was always the name of Jesus. When I got saved, Jesus became my Lord and Savior. I never used his name in vain like that ever again. And his love, his grace just washed my heart clean. And he definitely put a new song in my heart. And like you, I just want to lift up the name of Jesus. You know, proclaim how awesome he is, how good he is, how gracious he is. So another way we can violate this command is to not give God all the glory and honor that he alone deserves. When God is working in a wonderful, powerful way, how often will a pastor or a minister take credit or glory to themselves? You know, when people say, oh, that was a great message. It's like, okay, praise the Lord. I mean, I, I don't like it because I've seen too many pastors over the years. Oh, yes, that was great. I studied so hard. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, shut up. You know, give the glory to the Lord. If, if you're going to take credit for yourself for being a donkey that God can speak through, be careful. We can do that. We can also violate this command when we place our own limitations upon God. In other words, we can take his name in vain when we wrongly think things like, well, God, I know you love people, but there's no way you can love me. That's taking his name in vain. Of course he can love you. He can save you. He can save anybody. He loves everybody. Or we put limitations on him. Oh, God, I know you're so powerful and awesome, but I don't think you can handle this situation in my life. Are you kidding me? You're taking his name in vain. God, I've got this going on in my life, but I'm not sure you really care. Be careful. That's taking his name in vain. Of course he cares. He says, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. Later on in Exodus, Moses will ask the Lord to please show me your glory. Isn't that an amazing thing to ask for? God, I just want to see your glory. And he wasn't being flippant. Moses like, I just want to see your glory. I mean, he was in the presence of God. He never saw his form, never saw his face. But what an awesome thing to ask of the Lord. But in so many words, God told Moses, no, you cannot see me. Nobody can see my face and live. In other words, the glory of God would vaporize Moses. The, the glory of God. If he showed up right now in his glory and we're in our natural bodies, we'd just be a little pile of ashes all over the place. We couldn't handle his glory. So God tells Moses, this is in Exodus 34, he says, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and when I pass by, you'll be able to see my backside, just the backside of God's glory. And we know that when Moses comes down, he's just glowing. He put a bag over his head because he's glowing. I mean, it was amazing, just the radiance of God's glory, just seeing the backside of him. And so... This is what it says in Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6. This is when this took place. God put him up there. God passes by. And now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I'm going to reveal my glory to you. It's found in my name. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, and gracious, man, how we need his mercy and grace. Long-suffering, oh, he's been so patient with us. And abounding in goodness and truth. Goes on to say, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So God reveals his name to Moses by describing his nature and character to him. So do not take his name in vain. God is merciful. God is gracious. He is omnipotent. He abounds in goodness and truth. And from other scriptures, we know that God is love. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. So don't ever take his name in vain. When he says he loves you, then you better believe him. When he says my grace is sufficient for you, you better believe him. When he says the blood of Jesus will wash away all of your sins, you better believe him. When he says I'm preparing a place for you in glory and I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, 
you better believe him because God's word is true. When Jesus says he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, that is absolute truth. The Lord has put his name and his word and his reputation on the line. So lift up the name of Jesus on high, the name above all names. So quickly, let's look. I don't know how quick it'll be. Yeah, I got time. Chili supper doesn't start till 5. <laughs> so let's look at the fourth commandment. Look at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your female, uh, male servants, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now God has already laid out the groundwork for keeping the Sabbath for the Israelites. Remember when they came out of Egypt, God started feeding them with wonder bread, manna from heaven. Every day, they could only gather up each day what they could eat that day. They could not store it up because if they tried to store it up, it would turn to worms and stink. One day was given as a provision to gather up twice as much on Friday because he says, gather twice as much on Friday. That will sustain you on Saturday, the Sabbath. He says, I will not send any manna on Saturday. So the groundwork was already laid out, but here God makes it official. They were to work six days and then rest on the seventh. This was an amazing concept for the Jewish people. They had just spent 400 years in slavery. They worked seven days a week. They didn't accrue any vacation days. They weren't given any sick days. They were literally being worked to death by Pharaoh and his officers. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had some long stretches without a day off, but it's not good. It's not good for your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health. You need time to rest. Some of you moms might be thinking, I haven't had a day off in 30 years. Well, some of you need to kick that kid out of the house then. Anyway, sorry. These Israelites in Egypt, they didn't have any sick days. They weren't getting any vacation days. It was nonstop work, day in, day out. And so this is a very novel concept here. Everybody, all the children of Israel, rich, poor, young, old, everybody will take this day off. Even the animals were to have a day off. In other words, take the yoke off of them, that harness that they would pull the plow, take it off of them, let them rest, and if any foreigner came within your gates, don't let them work either. So it is a day of rest. Now, it's interesting that God makes this connection between keeping the Sabbath and the six days of creation. God created the world, the universe, the heavens and the earth in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. Now, God rested on the seventh day not because he was tired, not, not because he ran out of ideas, the word simply means to stop and to cease. And that's the meaning of the word Sabbath. To stop, cease, rest, because the work is done. Now the language of the Bible, both here in Exodus and in Genesis 1, is that God created the entire universe, everything in this world, in six literal days. Now I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that try and say that God was using poetic language, and every day represents millions and millions of years. Baloney. That's a dangerous thing to do. I don't want to be guilty of saying what parts of the Bible should be taken literally, and what parts should be allegorically taken. 99% of the time when the word yom is used in Hebrew, it means a 24-hour day. Remember the six days of creation. Evening and morning, day one, evening more, day two. He just very clearly sets it out as 24-hour days. When Jesus took the words of the Old Testament, he took them literally. And so be careful not to spiritualize away the clear teachings of God's word. 
The big question concerning the Sabbath day is this. Are Christians required to keep the Sabbath on Saturday, or can we rest and worship on Sunday, or can we rest and worship on any day? First of all, let me just say this. It's a great idea to take at least one day off every week just to rest and get recharged, to rest and be with the Lord, to hang out with your family, to stop and cease and break the routine of grinding away at life. That's important. Obviously, God knows better than we do what is best for us. But the question is, are we under the old covenant of worshiping on the Saturday are we wrong because we are gathered here on Sunday? The answer to both questions is no. We're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. First of all, the Sabbath law is a covenant between God and the people of Israel. Just as circumcision was given by God to Abraham, and it was a covenant between him and the Israelites all the days of their life. The clearest passage on this with the Sabbath Look at these verses in uh, Exodus 31, starting in verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel. Children of Israel. Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is, here's the clear verse on it, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, Sunday quickly became the day that Christian, early church started worshiping the Lord. They adopted this because that was the day Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Sabbath is the seventh day, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. And so you guys are getting off easy. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul writes, On the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, soaring up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. But here's the most important reason why we're no longer obligated to worship God on the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the law and prophets. He fulfilled the Sabbath. He's a fulfillment of the day of rest. In other words, we experience eternal rest from the Lord, because Jesus fulfilled it all on our behalf. He's done everything for our salvation. So the Apostle Paul says, and Paul was very Jewish, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. So let no one judge you in food, whether you eat a kosher diet, that's between you and the Lord, that's fine. Remember when Peter goes up into Galatia, Paul's up there with all these Gentile believers in the area of Galatia, and they're enjoying ham sandwiches, pork rolls. And it says Peter's eating with them. And then it says the Judaizers come up from Jerusalem and Peter withdrew from those Christians in Galatia. And Paul gets in his face saying, you, Peter, you are Jew, living like a Gentile. Now you're telling these Gentiles they have to live like Jews. And that was, that's why he called him a hypocrite in Galatians chapter two. We're not under that law. But, be that as it may, he said, where was I? Um, Let no one judge you in food. Okay, kosher, that's great. If you want to be kosher, that's awesome. In drink or regarding a festival, that's speaking of the feast days, you want to celebrate the feast days, awesome. You're not obligated to, but it's a great thing to do. I mean, the feast days all point to Jesus. Or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. 
So Paul is saying that the Sabbath day is a shadow of Christ. Again, Jesus fulfilled the law, all of it. In our true rest, that's what Sabbath means, rest. Our true rest is found in Jesus. So that simply means we enjoy our rest in the Lord every day. Not just one day a week, but every day is a holy day unto the Lord. Every day we rest in Him and praise Him for all that He has done for our salvation. And it doesn't really matter if we gather on Saturday or Sunday. Again, Paul says this in Romans chapter 14, verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. It could be Saturday. It could be Sunday. This is my take. Another esteems every day alike. I like that. I worship Jesus every day. I praise the Lord every day. I'm not like... You know, and some people say, oh, Sunday, that's the only day you can worship the Lord on Sunday. And then they live like the world, the flesh and the devil, Friday night and Saturday night. Got to come to church on Sunday. I'll do my penance or whatever, and I'm okay. No, every day is holy to the Lord. One person esteems one above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. So don't let anybody judge you on this matter. Every day is a great day to worship the Lord. Again, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest, Sabbath. We rest in him. Remember the times the religious Pharisees accused Jesus and his disciples of breaking the Sabbath? Your disciples are walking through these grain fields. They're plucking grain. It's on the Sabbath. They're winnowing it in their hands, blowing off the chaff. They're working. They're eating on the Sabbath. Ah, they get all mad at Jesus about it. And then they get mad at Jesus. You're healing on the Sabbath. Yeah. How did Jesus respond to that? Here's an example. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man. It was made for our benefit, to rest in the Lord. You guys have turned it into a burden, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Again, Jesus is all about setting people free. He doesn't want us bound up with a bunch of rules, rituals, and regulations. There's no rest in those things, but there's perfect rest and peace in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished, paid in full, to tell us die. It's done. And now I'm completely saved by his grace. And all my sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ. And so now I rest in Him. He has given me eternal life, and so I rest in Him. I don't do anything to try to stay on God's good side or try to earn extra points from God. When we walk in the Spirit, we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We just surrender to the Lord and say, Here I am, Lord. I'm yours. You're the potter. I'm just a lump of clay. Mold me and shape me into the vessel you want me to be. And so it's not by keeping a law that you will find rest, but it's coming to Jesus, the one who's fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law on our behalf. And then we just receive his grace, his forgiveness, and that is when you enter into the, the glorious Sabbath rest that Jesus has for you. Look at these verses. I'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 3. You can turn there if you want. Hebrews, starting in uh, chapter 3, verse 16, the writer says, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Remember, when all the Israelites came out of Egypt, they get to the promised land. It only took a, you know, it's only a two-week journey, but... About a year after the Ten Commandments and everything, they will go to the Promised Land and they won't enter in because of unbelief. Twelve spies were sent in. Only Joshua and Caleb said, the land is ours. God's given it to us. The ten said, no, we're going to die. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And they turned everybody against the Lord and His promises. So God says, okay, all of you 20 years old and above, you're not going to enter in. You're going to die off in the wilderness. That's why they marched around for another 20, you know, 39 years or so. And that whole generation died off. And so then the Lord tells this next generation, you're going in. 
But here's why, their unbelief. Verse 18, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, I swore my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Remember the Bible says Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying, In David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Joshua enters in. They still didn't have rest. They're still in battle after battle after battle when they come into the promised land. And so David is speaking 500 years later about entering into his rest. They still haven't. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. And so we rest in the finished work of Jesus. Praise the Lord. I'm not striving and struggling to earn anything from God. I just want to live for him because he's done everything for me. You should be able to say amen for your own life as well. So that's the first four commandments, all about our relationship with the Lord. Jesus summed all these commandments up by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Next time, Lord willing, if we're still here, uh, we'll look at the next six or so, maybe less. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two are fulfilled all the law and the prophets.